Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'd love to tell you this morning, at first, about one of my very dearest friends. One of my very dearest friends is a Cistercian nun, or she was a Cistercian nun before she went unto glory, and her name was Sister Mary Robert. She had this wicked sense of humor. I could tell you stories from the convent uh, that you might not expect to hear about coming from a place like a convent, but Sister Mary Robert had this exceedingly sharp wit And she also had this eye and heart for those who were suffering. For as long as I knew her, she was battling a debilitating form of bone cancer. And on her good days, when I would ask her how she was doing, she would say, marvelous, marvelous, I'm marvelous. And on the bad days, the days when she could barely move her fingers because she was in so much pain, on the bad days when I would ask Sister Mary Robert how she was, she would look at me earnestly and smile and say, well, my dear, God is in his heaven. This is basically the nun version of, I'm hanging in there. I've been thinking about Sister Mary Robert quite a bit over these past days because I've noticed a uh, a pattern in the way that we've been interacting with one another throughout this pandemic. Because about a year ago, when I would ask people how they were doing, typically the response was something like, oh good, fine, oh I'm well, how are you? And these days, generally on Zoom, when I'm asking people how they're doing, I hear things like, I'm hanging in there, one day at a time. Well, you know, I'm okay. No matter who we are, or what our life circumstances may be, each one of us has looked into darkness this year. Whether we're strong or we're weak, whether we're well or we're, uh, we're ill, whether we're young or old or rich or poor, every single one of us this year has looked into darkness and wondered about the motives of God. And still we light this candle. We're still invited into these weeks of Advent every year. You know, we think about liturgical time not as being this circle that comes back and eats itself beginning and end, or not as this projection of a linear time that just extends forward with no beginning or end, but we think about this liturgical year as a spiral that carries us upward. So no matter how many times we come around again and celebrate the feasts with one another in church or perhaps watching at home, We are always being invited upward into something new. There is something new that God is teaching us. And so here we are, right? Again, here we are in Advent on this precipice and threshold of Christmas. It's Gaudete Sunday. That's the traditional name of this third Sunday of Advent that comes to us from the Latin command Gaudete, which means rejoice. Traditionally, the very first words of the Mass were Gaudete, rejoice because our Lord's coming is near. As early as the 5th century, these weeks of Advent were marked as something of a little Lent, as we've talked about in this month. These weeks since the 5th century were marked by fasting and penance, as Christians saved up the best of their resources, their food and their drink, for the great 12 days of the Feast of Christmas. Christians took deliberate care to examine their souls, to lay them before God, and to enter into this somewhat darker, deliberate, penitential time before they would rejoice on Christmas Eve. Now, I don't know a lot of things for sure, But one of the things I do know is that there are only so many weeks that the average person can spend examining their soul without a bit of a break. The medieval church knew this too, and thus Gaudete Sunday comes to us as rest for a penitent heart. In many churches, we light the pink candle, the rose 
candle, reminding us to breathe, to celebrate, to pray, and rejoice. But what is Rejoicing Sunday? Gaudete Sunday? What is a Gaudete Sunday in a world that's just hanging in there? What does a pink candle illuminate that could possibly scatter the darkness? In our epistle this morning, we have St. Paul writing to the Thessalonians, and he insists, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. How is this possible? St. Paul, what are you up to? He's writing this in what is possibly his oldest letter that we have evidence, from, evidence of being in his own hand. And he's telling these Thessalonians in the early 50s, not the 1950s, not the 1550s, just the 50s. <laughs> He's telling them in these perilous circumstances, just 20 years after the crucifixion of Christ, that what they are to do is rejoice in all circumstances. The Thessalonians are struggling. This is a city in the northeastern coast of Greece. It is a port that is a center of trade and commerce and politics. And it's a city that's marked by the pagan and the secular cultures of money and power and wealth. The Christians are in a distinctly weird minority here, and nobody wants anything to do with them. They're threatening to upend the system of power that's held the city of Thessalonica together for centuries. And these Christians are disrupting it with a message of the Christ who tells them something new. Money was the central concern. Power was the central concern. And amidst the prosperous, these Christians were beginning to face persecution. They didn't want to be powerful. They wanted to worship God. They wanted to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they wanted to build up his church. The people around them wanted them silenced. And the Thessalonians faced increasing hostility, rejection, prohibition from public life, and yet Paul, in this very ancient letter, is telling their hearts to rejoice. Think back a couple of weeks ago, and our very own Father BJ, who's back there running the cameras today, he told us to think about joy as a way of life. Now, we all know that Father BJ is in saintly company, and sometimes on the live stream, if you look very close, you'll see a little nimbus of a halo above his head. <laughs> because if you look at the writings of the saints throughout the history of the church, by and large, they tell us something very similar. Joy. Joy. What is joy? Well, the saints of the church have always pointed towards joy as that thing emblematic of the Christian heart rooted in Jesus. The saints interpret the scripture, right, by the graces of the Holy Spirit, and they all have something to tell us about this nature of the true joy that St. Paul is calling the Thessalonians and each one of us to during Advent. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that joy is not merely happiness. It's not a feeling that we have in response to something that pleases us. But rather, true, holy, Christian joy, Thomas tells us, is a well-being of the Spirit in response to what exists. A well-being of the Spirit in response to what exists. It's not a feeling, but it's rather a state of solidity and peace. It's something rooted in the knowledge that God loves us. It is an elderly woman, broken with disease, smiling at the one that she loves with the assurance, well, my dear, God is in his heaven. Some 700 years after St. Thomas Aquinas and about 1,900 years after St. Paul, a young Jesuit priest wrote about joy, of all places, in the midst of Nazi Germany. Father Alfred Delp served as the rector of an ordinary parish in the city of Berlin 
He preached about peace, and he helped his Jewish neighbors escape to safety in Switzerland using an underground network of faithful Christians. He was 36 years old when he was arrested by the Nazis because he had spent the entirety of his priesthood refusing to submit to the tyranny of the Nazis who told him that there were people on earth who were not as worthy of the love of God. And so at the age of 36, he's thrown in prison just outside of Munich. He's arrested, he's sent to prison, he's kept in chains, and in fact it was the rule that anyone who had been understood to be conspiring against Hitler was kept in chains, hands and feet, even when they were within the confines of their cell. And so while Father Delp is in prison with his hands literally bound by chains, he writes <coughs> sermons about Advent. He celebrates the Mass. He consecrates the holy body and blood of Jesus Christ on whatever it is he used to serve as an altar. And he writes about the promises of God that come to him in darkness. All of the Christian life is Advent, he wrote. All of the Christian life is awaiting Jesus. Most remarkably, just two months before he was executed by the Nazis in 1945, it was December, the season of Advent. On December 8th, Father Delp wrote a meditation for this third Sunday of Advent. He wrote a meditation about Gaudete Sunday, the Sunday of rejoicing in the promises of God. And in this meditation, this imprisoned, marked for death, young, courageous priest wrote, We are created for a life that knows itself to be blessed, sent, and touched at its deepest center by God himself. In our lives, so often, he writes, so often in our lives, we sit in musty bomb shelters. We suffer the harassment of driven days, of counted hours, of a vibrating fear. Delp knew fear intimately, and yet even in his literal chains, he wrote that we were meant for joy. So where is joy? How do we do this? How do we do it? And what does it look like? What does joy look like? Well, Advent tells us it looks like Jesus. Advent tells us that true joy looks like Jesus. And in fact, in his first public sermon that we get in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus stands in the synagogue of his hometown in Nazareth, and he reads those words aloud from the prophet Isaiah. Dan Buckingham, did you know that you were going to be Jesus for us today? <laughs> because Jesus did exactly what our brother Dan did this morning. He picked up that text from Isaiah. He stood in the midst of the synagogue. He read it out loud, and he told the people who heard him that God was keeping his promise. He reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to release the prisoners, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort all who mourn. Jesus proclaims that this covenant is being fulfilled. Isaiah the prophet called Israel into a hope for the one that would turn their, their ashes into garland, and Jesus is there to tell them, that it is garland again. Joy is a spirit of well-being in response to what exists. And no matter where we find ourselves, in prison, in pain, in the year 2020, what exists is Jesus. God has kept his promise of deliverance and worked a mighty salvation for the whole world. This morning, this is the best kind of sermon when you know the end is in green pen under the printed text. 
This morning, on my drive into church, I was thinking and watching the sun come up over the trees on Connecticut Avenue, and I suddenly became aware that the radio had started to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, commonly known as Ode to Joy. And I'm choosing to believe that this is not a coincidence and that there is some hopelessly faithful and nerdy DJ on WETA playing Ode to Joy specifically for us today on Gaudete Sunday. And I thought about this and the music itself, the music itself seemed to align with Advent. Now I'm not gonna sing it, although I did try to oppress Peter into playing it for me, but if you're familiar with the more famous movement of Ode to Joy, it's a hymn in the hymnal. We've added some text to it there. The thing about it is that you almost don't notice it when it begins. I was driving, thinking, watching the sun, and suddenly it sort of stirred in my consciousness this seed that something remarkable was taking place. Because the music begins with just a couple of strings. Just a couple of strings in the silence playing the melody and it repeats and it's gentle and it kind of wends its way over the course of these measures and suddenly another instrument is added. And then there's another one and then suddenly you're paying attention because something on the earth is beginning to shake in the verses and the, the measures of this music. And then of course the cellos are added and more instruments come in and suddenly before you know it there's this crescendo of human voices together proclaiming the glory of this ode to joy. And then you're crying in your car on Connecticut Avenue. And isn't that just the Christian life? Isn't that just this season of Advent that Father Delp told us makes up the entirety of the Christian life? Because it begins in obscurity, and it begins in darkness, and yet it will culminate in the illumination of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It begins in pain, it begins in brokenness. It begins in sorrow with just a few instruments daring to proclaim this remarkable word into the silence of the morning. And we know that it ends with nothing less than the joy that raises the dead. And we're almost there. We're almost there. Christmas is under two weeks away. Don't fret. Don't worry about the things you haven't done. Don't worry about the things that people tell us we need to do for Christmas. You're called to wait for the Savior of the world, not be the Savior of the world. Christmas, joy, peace. These things are our soul's foundation of a well-being in the face of whatever it is that exists. They are ours unconditionally. They are ours from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Rejoice always indeed, because, my dears, God is in his heaven. God is in his heaven. Amen. Amen. Amen.